JBN to keep you informed. I'm Michelle Jones. Hi, guys. Before we get into the news, please remember to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the news with someone today. Now on to the news. Teacher shot in home attack. A teacher has been hospitalized with chest and upper left side wounds after gunmen smashed open a window to a St. Andrew home and opened fire in the wee hours of Sunday morning. The incident occurred sometime after 3 a.m. in a section of Lawrence Tavern, St. Andrew, called Burn Shop. Investigators have theorized that the educator, who recently moved to the area, may not have been the target of the attack. It is understood that her son, who lives at the same address, may have been the target. The shooting has left the farming district on edge. A resident of the community said that it took them by surprise. We never come out when we hear they shot them. But as soon as it was safe to do so, people gather up and we hear some mumbling. Is that really she them go for? Anybody in the house could have got shot and died. Luckily that never happened. But she must fear now like we, especially the elderly, a resident said. A source close to the investigation corroborated what some residents were saying. I never see them go for. But the teacher son here the dog a bark and go outside go look. And when him go out, somebody grab a fire and he run back inside. Then the gunman them go run at the back window and broke in at the window and shoot up inside. As saw the lady get shot, the anonymous source said. A senior investigator said that the police are following all leads and are seeking to restore calm to the community. Between January 1 and April 13 this year, the St. Andrew North Police Division recorded 21 shootings. This represents a 31% year-on-year increase or five more shootings than seen in the corresponding period in 2023. Where injuries are concerned, there were 16 cases, three more than the corresponding period last year. In the murder column, the division recorded 13, which is a decline of 7% or one fewer year-on-year. -year. The national murder toll now stands at 311. Man fatally shot by Lyston Fire Mulder in St. James. A man reportedly shot and injured another man was later fatally shot after he was challenged by a Lyston Fire Mulder in St. James on Sunday afternoon. The deceased has been identified as 22-year-old Brendan Campbell of a St. James address. It is alleged that about 5.15 p.m. on Pega Road, Campbell alighted from a great Toyota Axial and opened fire at the injured man. A Lyston Fire Mulder, who was nearby at the time of the incident, reportedly challenged Campbell, who was shot in the process. The car from which Campbell earlier lighted reportedly sped away from the scene. An illegal gun was reportedly seized at the scene. Both injured men were taken to hospital, where Campbell was pronounced dead, and the other man admitted for treatment. The St. James Police are investigating. The St. James Police are investigating. 76 rounds of ammunition seized in St. Elizabeth. The St. Elizabeth police are reporting the seizure of 76 rounds of ammunition during an operation in Potsdam District on Monday. No one was arrested. The police report that a team was in the area when acting on intelligence and unoccupied premises was searched. They say a bag was discovered and the 76 12-gauge cartridges were found inside of it. Monday's seizure came on the heels of three legal guns recovered since Friday and the arrest of four people. Six firefighters electrocuted while putting out house fire in Greenwich Town. Six firefighters received an electric shock while working at the scene of a house fire on 7th Street in Greenwich Town, St. Andrew, early Tuesday morning. Three of them have been admitted at the Kingston Public Hospital. The extent of their injuries is not clear. The six male firefighters are attached to the Trenchtown Fire Station and responded to a call at 2.17 a.m. Commissioner Stuart Beckford Head of the Jamaica Fire Brigade says the injuries to the other three members were not considered serious. When we got there and got into operation, three of the firefighters came in contact with uh, electric wires, uh, which from all appearance would have appeared to be illegal electrical connection. Uh, the other three tried to assist them, and that is how they would have also um, received shock. Three of them are serious enough to be admitted to the hospital. The other three have been uh, have sought medical attention at another private facility. Beckford says the incident arose as a result of illegal electrical connection. I just want to make a special appeal to Jamaicans to desist from this practice because we suspect that the fire would have started as a result of that, and we're also suspicious 
that it was an illegal connection that would have caused the injuries that the firefighters have sustained. It is difficult when you do firefighting operations at night to pick up on these things. In the day, we do come across them and we take the necessary precautions to ensure that we maintain our safety. But in the night, when it's dark, it's difficult to see the illegal connection. Beckford said the fire was extinguished by other firefighters on the scene. Minister of Local Government Desmond McKenzie is also calling for the public to seize illegal electricity connections. McKenzie argued that the country's firefighters are doing a dangerous job and members of the public should not do anything to increase their risk of injury or death. He said there needs to be greater levels of compliance with the law and a social responsibility. The local government minister noted that the country's firefighters are critical to the protection and development of communities. The wider society and the government through the ministry will ensure that their welfare is secured. I must make a public appeal for the practice of illegal throughups to cease. It is a clear fire and electrocution risk to those who make these illegal connections, as well as to other people who inhabit the structures that are attached to them. Security guard Jones in Blue Lagoon in Portland. The Portland police are probing the death of a man who drowned while swimming with friends at Blue Lagoon on Monday. He has been identified as 20-year-old security guard Robert Ford of a David Lane address in Port Antonio. This marks the second joining in a week within the parish. Last Tuesday, a second-year student of the College of Agriculture, Science and Education joined at one of the institution's beaches. According to reports, Ford went to the lagoon with some friends when he encountered difficulty while swimming. Ford reportedly jumped into the water and he went under. It is understood that Ford, who was reportedly playing around with friends in the water, went under again, came back up and then disappeared. Lifeguards jumped into the water after realizing that Ford was in trouble and after a few minutes, he was pulled out in a state of unconsciousness. It is theorized that friends and onlookers thought that he was playing a game. Ford was later pronounced dead at the scene by a doctor, and the body was later removed to the morgue. Concerns have been raised regarding the response time of the police, with some individuals claiming that they arrived at the scene of the incident long after being summoned. Former House Clerk Valerie Curtis breaks her silence. Former Clerk to the Houses of Parliament Valerie Curtis has said she will accept nothing less than a public withdrawal by House Speaker Juliet Holness of a March 22 letter of reprimand sent to her and copied to 62 lawmakers in the lower house. On March 26, the Deaf Finance Minister, Dr. Nigel Clark, closed the budget debate in Parliament. The former clerk said she was invited to a meeting with the Speaker. When I entered her office, she looked at me and said, Miss Curtis, how are you feeling? I said, Madam Speaker, how do you expect me to feel? If it were you, how would you feel? The former house clerk recounted that she and her son were traveling home on the Mandela Highway on March 25, while she was on departmental leave, when the contents of the letter being discussed and read at Jamaica 94 FMs beyond the headlines. Continuing, she said, Imagine, I was driving home with my son. My son was at the wheel, and I heard it on Dion Jackson Miller's program. She said when the allegations were being made against her, her son was visibly shaken. Everybody knows the relationship I have with my son. If I'm hurt, he's hurt. And worse, if he's hurt, I am hurt. And so I was wondering, Mom, what you did? Because he didn't know any background. So just hearing this, can you imagine the shock? While keeping her eyes fixed on her son, Curtis said her phone started to ring as several persons tried to reach her to console her and offer words of comfort. That night, and a few nights after, I saw my son come into my room to check. Mom, are you all right? Sometimes he peeks in to see if I'm sleeping. It affected him badly, she said. She said it was the following day when she turned up at work that she saw the letter marked confidential on her desk, but with its contents already in the public domain. She heard that she's a Christian believer. The former clerk said that one of her pastors called while she was on the highway that afternoon and prayed with her. Her church brethren rallied around her when she attended services on Holy Thursday and Good Friday with another round of prayers offered upon her behalf. The now retired Curtis said she also received calls from around the world including words of encouragement from her Commonwealth counterparts and friends from other jurisdictions. At the March 26 meeting with the Speaker, Curtis said she informed Holness that she was told by the Human Resources Director that the letter was returned. However, she said the Speaker did not respond to her comment. In the event that it is withdrawn, based on what the HR Director has said, I don't want no secret withdrawal. I want to make on the whole world to know, just like how the letter went out there, she said. She called me to a meeting about minutes to two, 
I told her in that meeting that I want the letter withdrawn, she insisted. On March 26, the Speaker entered the chambers of the House more than 30 minutes late, apparently because of the meeting with Curtis. Philip Paulwell, leader of opposition business in the House, asked the Speaker whether she would withdraw the controversial missive. She told Paulwell she was having dialogue with the then clerk to the Houses. On the matter of the clerk, I advise you, both from myself and the clerk, that we're in dialogue and wish to say nothing else at this point, she said. In a telephone conversation, Curtis said she asked the HR director what would be the protocol for withdrawing the letter, seeing that she had informed her that anything placed in a person's file could not be withdrawn. The speaker had instructed in her letter that the document be placed on Curtis's file. Curtis told the speaker that if the letter has been withdrawn, she has the responsibility to make a public disclosure about the retraction. I still have the letter sent to me by the speaker, as it has not been retrieved from me, she said. Meanwhile, the former clerk, or Braden Information Minister Robert Morgan, for remarks he made at a post-cabinet press briefing last week, that the thing that hurts me more than anything else was when the Minister of Information, Robert Morgan, said that the country has better things to think about than a letter of reprimand, she said. I really felt crushed by that because that was quite irresponsible, inconsiderate and arrogant, she said. Morgan described as immaterial public debate over whether the Speaker should withdraw the letter of reprimand she wrote to the former clerk. JBN will keep you informed. Please remember to subscribe, like, share, leave us a comment and click the notification bell to receive our daily news items.